Welcome back to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. This mute Miss Robin McCray. Robin McCray's first encounter with the Sasquatch people was when she was very small and has had contact with them ever since. She's been an active habituator and experiencer her whole life. Robin has worked with many cryptids as well as other beings. Wow. The Sasquatch people have taught her many things. She has learned more things than she ever could have believed. And her contact and relationships continues yet today. Robin's had a lifetime of experiences with them, and she looks forward to many more. And she's here to tell us about those. Welcome, Robin. Thank Give you. a big Hastings welcome. Okay, try that. Okay, I thought so. He told me it was off, so it was like, although maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> Thanks, Trent. Welcome, everybody. This is my second year at the conference. It, this is one of my favorite events all year. I look forward to this. Harriet and Kenny are the best. Like, you don't get treated better anywhere. So, you know, hats off to them because they're amazing. Um, a little bit about my background. Oh, they told me to sit down because people were having problems with seeing. Well, as long as you stand on the side, it'll be fine. Okay. Yes, we can't see you back here. That's probably a good thing for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's early in the morning, people. Don't ask for a lot. Okay. Um, and please excuse me. I'm not sick. I've just had really, really bad allergies the last few days. So if I have to use the cleaners, just ignore me. Anyway, my background is as a very small child. And when I say small, I mean before I could talk. These were around me. And I assumed, incorrectly, that this was part of everybody's world, not just mine. I was not aware that not everybody experienced this. Um, they do a form of what they call mind speak or telepathy. I could do that before I could talk. Again, something I thought everybody did. And I was very surprised when I find out, found out they did not. By the time I was four, and back in those ages, back when they invented the wheel, you could go to anywhere and play, and you didn't have to be standing right next to your parents. So I would go to the end of our block, and they had these great big mounds of dirt that people rode bikes on and, <clears throat> and enjoyed themselves. And I would go down there, and I'd build sand castles and things in the dirt, and the Bigfoot would step out of the woods where I was at, and I'd look over, and they were just like my big projectors. They were there. Again, no idea not everybody experienced this. I, I really and truly did not understand that they didn't. Um, my first ET abduction, I was four, that I remember, and I was told at that time that it had happened before. So when I got to the point where I talked to my mom and dad about it, I had very kind parents. My parents never said, oh, you're making it up, we don't believe you. They just simply looked at me and said, we want to help you, babe, but we have no idea because we don't have anything, you know, we don't experience it. The Patterson-Gimlin movie and books and things were not out yet. There was no resources researchers to talk to, there was no resources to go to. So at that time, it was just me, myself, and I. As I got older, I didn't talk about it a lot with a lot of people because I thought, you know, I know this is happening, what's wrong with me? And that's when I started to understand that this was not normal. 
My normal is everybody's abnormal. And I like it that way. It works out really well for me. So as I grew up, they were around. The dogmen were around. The Bigfoots were around. They would talk in my mind. And I talked to a couple people about it that thought I was nuts. So I went completely silent. When I got in my 20s and I'm living by myself, now this is going on every day. This is not something that, you know, it was once in a great while. The, I have contact daily in one form or another. And then other people started seeing what was going on around me. I mean, it's really hard to hide a giant Bigfoot. Okay, so when people would come to my house, they'd look out in my yard and they would see one run across the yard. Or they would hear them talking in the woods. So there were various signs that other people picked up. At that point, I got extremely guarded. I didn't want people. I didn't want people to know they were there. I'm excessively protective about them. I've protected them my entire life, and will continue to do so. I've taken ridicule. I've taken criticisms. I've taken death threats. They're worth it. Every bit of it. They are worth it, and I will always continue to do that. So as I got older, and all of these crazy experiences continued. It expanded. It wasn't just Bigfoot. It wasn't just Dogman. There were other things that came in and, and talked to me. And I was like everybody in the beginning. I thought they were an animal. They're covered in hair. Why would you not think they're an animal? Let me explain something. They're not. These may not be our people, but they are a type of people. There's never been a time that they were not a type of people. In 2009, I moved to another location, and this activity has happened everywhere I go. And I used to think to myself, you know, am I crazy? But every other aspect of my life is normal. So how can I be normal everywhere else except here? And why are other people seeing what I'm seeing? So I got to the point in my tw early 20s, I even went and had a psychiatric evaluation because I thought I was losing my mind. I'm as sane as everybody else. In fact, the therapist got done with me and said, you know what, now I believe in Bigfoot. So, <laughs> you know, the pictures don't lie. When I got into my 40s, because I'm definitely up there, um, I was at a location where I was living, and they walked everywhere around the property. It was very common. My, my children grew up around them. That was the other thing. My godchildren, my children, and now my grandchildren all experienced these amazing people. And they do what they call cloaking, which is really hard to understand. It's hard to comprehend unless you physically see one. I had seen it for years, but then I had one that I call shadow come and stand for me to that projector and look at me. Out in the open, not in the woods. We're talking in the open of the yard. And we stood there and stared at each other anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. I wasn't looking at my watch. I was too thrilled. And my son was coming towards me and walking through tall grass. And the Bigfoot do what they call a belly crawl, or a crab crawl. They lay on their belly, and if anybody's ever watched Scooby-Doo, remember when he gets on his toes and you hear those little ding, 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 ding noises? Bigfoots do it too without the noise. And they go all through the grass, and they have a wicked sense of humor. They think it's hysterical to knock you on your tush because they've pulled your legs out from under you, and they laugh hysterically when they do so. So my son was coming towards me, and I hollered to my son, and I'm like, you know, don't just come straight. Just know that they're in front of you. And when I said that, it scared Shadow. He simply cloaked right in front of my eyes. He went from a solid form to clear. Now, there's two kinds of cloaking. There's a complete cloak, which you see nothing. It's like looking at nothing there. And then there's what a lot of people experience that looks like the predator effect, like a gelled water. And that's what people call a shimmer. And he did the complete cloak. Another thing they do while cloaking is they'll walk up to you and they do what's called counting coup. And it, you know, years ago it was a ritual of passage and the little kids had to be brave enough to go up to one of our people, put their hands on them while cloaked to see if they could get away with it because nobody could tell they were coming. Now they do it just to be funny. And as you can see, I have thick fuzzy hair and they like to come up behind me and, and pat my hair. They, for whatever reason, they like the hair. And they like my windows open, and, and a lot of times, I don't have curtains on my house. When I change my clothing, I'm in the bathroom where they can't see me because I have smoked out windows. And I would, they like my bed by the window. And for many years, if I moved my bed away from the window, they would just have a fit. They'd pound on the house all night long. 
And I would wake up because I had my window open and I would have mud and leaves in my hair, either braided in my hair or just in my hair. I put an air conditioner in the window. I lived in Michigan at the time. I'm born and raised in Michigan. I'm currently in South Carolina working my way back to Michigan because I don't like living on the sun. And I went back and I was in my room and it was so hot in Michigan at that time, I put a window air conditioner in. I woke up in the morning to find the window air conditioner was mangled in the middle of the woods. They did not like the windows blocked. And I was like, okay, I got the message. I've got it. Um, I'm in, what was it, 2012. And I communicate with them. Not only do I speak telepathically with them, but I do speak verbally. And so they had told me I needed to meet someone by the name of Melba Ketchum, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Dr. Melba Ketchum in the Sasquatch Genome Project. And I didn't know her. I didn't even know they were working on the project, to be honest with you. You know, you have to understand that for 40 years, I did this by myself. I didn't have contact. I got into this field of what they now are calling research, which for me, it's not research. This is my life. Not because I chose it, but because this is what my life was. And I did that because of Dr. Igor Borstev. He had heard of me through someone that I, the only person I ever spoke to about what was going on at my home. And he contacted me and he said, I'm standing here with Igor Borstev. And I'm like, okay. No, no, this is a big deal. This is Igor Borstev, top researcher in the world. He wants to meet you. And I said, all right. He's supposed to come for three hours and stay for 10 days because the evidence was so overwhelming. He's like, I can't leave. And he only left because he had a flight back to Russia. So when he left, he said, we're doing a conference there and you got to be there. So he flew me to Siberia with Ron Moorhead there which was amazing, because Ron is, is it, guys. And so we went to the conference in Russia, and I spoke there about them as well. Back to Melba. So they had told me they wanted me to contact her, that she needed my help. I said, for what? I'm not a scientist. I don't claim to be. I'm not an expert. I don't believe there are experts in this field. If you come up to somebody and they tell you, I am an expert in the research of Bigfoot, that is the person to avoid. We will never be experts. There's too much information. There's no playbook to go to to see if we even get it right. So there is no experts. I know I'm certainly not one. And I, I will never claim to be an expert. I know my experiences. I know what the Bigfoot have taught me through the years. That's what I know. Okay, that's my classification and all of it. So they wanted me to get hold of Melba. I said, I don't know her. But I did have a friend that knew someone that knew her. And I said, yeah, just give her my number. If she wants to get hold of me, she will. And she did. The Sasquatch Dino Project happened because Melba Ketchum had people coming to her for species identification. She started out as a vet, went into forensic, DNA, identified bodies at 9-11, testified in court cases for the FBI, CIA. Her credentials are just immense, okay? She is, people have a very wrong opinion of her and the limitations that she has on her intelligence. So I talked to her. And I said, I can't offer you anything in the way of science. I'm going to be DNA things. I can do that all day long. I can give you photos. You can come out with them and interact with them, but, you know, it's the best I can do. So I helped her with a lot of paperwork, which is only my pay grade at that point. And we got to be very good friends. I was there during testing. I was there after it went on. I was there for the massacre and the bloodbath they did to her after the test results came out. The reason the Foots wanted me to speak with Melba is because she got it right. All right, They're not going to want me to go to a person and help them promote what they are if they got it wrong. It's that simple. Six weeks after I met her, she said to me, you know, you're the only one that has not asked me for the results. I don't need to ask you for the results because I asked them. I asked them years ago. I was out in the side yard of my house. I had three of them in front of me, and I said, you know, People are fighting over you guys. I mean, I didn't even know about Facebook until Igor put me on it. And I said, people are fighting over you. They don't know what you are. I mean, I know you're my friends. What are you? And they pointed to me and they said, we are human like you. I said, okay. They said, and star people. I figured they would know what they are. So I said to Melba, I said, I didn't ask for the results because they told me. I said, what did you get? Now, that was what they told me, so we're going to take that, set it off to the side, okay? Because I'm not going to quote anything from the paper. I'm not, I'm not a scientist. I'm not going to do that. I don't do that. 
But what I will tell you that is from the paper is the mitochondrial side, which is the mom, came back human. There were tests done to make sure that the people that were involved with that testing, it did not match their DNA. So that's one of the myths that are out there that is very untrue. It is not anybody from the, the study's DNA. Nobody came into contact with it to get that human result. It was done with robotic arms. These tests were done in the top labs in the country. 133 samples were tested. And that doesn't mean that's how many were in. We had hundreds come in. We took the best of the samples and that's what were used. On the father's side, in a scientific standpoint, they have to test that with what is in GenBank and other databases. They can only use what's in those bases. Nothing showed up on the father's side. So that's why if you read the paper, it says unknown. She's being completely transparent. It's very accurate. The father is listed scientifically speaking as unknown. They don't have the genetics in GenBank to test that to say what that is. So father for the paper is unknown. So that's where it deviates because she has no access for that nuclear side. I may not have tested it. I asked them. Okay. Dogmen are the same way. When you ask the dogmen, they'll tell you. They're, they're pretty forthcoming. They're a little more stoic than a Bigfoot. They, you know, the Bigfoot are kind of hysterically funny in their own way. And some of the dogmen will be playful, but for the most part, they're more stoic. They guard the woods. And they are a dog, a canine, and a, or I mean a canine, a human, and an ET split. So that's where that varies. So I worked on the study with her. She's still one of my dearest friends today. And I continued to hang out with my Bigfoot. Do you want to put the photos up? Yeah. During the course of this time, there's so many paranormal things that are out there. I tell people this a lot. The world that we see is not reality. There's a whole other world out there. When people are ready, they will accept it. I'm not here to change anybody's opinion. I'm not here to try to prove anything. My job isn't to prove anything. It really isn't. And I honestly don't try. Um, what I do is I share my experiences, I tell people what these people have taught me. And that's at the end of the day, that's the best I can do. My husband, Pat, who's at the back, back there by the books, he's experienced a lot of the paranormal things with them as well. And as I always tell everybody, you know, if you're not comfortable asking questions in an audience form and you want to come back, please feel free to come back and ask anything. I ask questions too. We are here to learn from each other. The Bigfoot work under the law of raw, which is the law of one, which means they work as a collective, meaning that they, it takes all of them to form their collective, and it's at a higher consciousness. These are people that have laws, culture, family units. They have a, a written language. They have an alphabet. They can speak our language. They can speak their language. These are a people. If it walks like a duck and it looks like a duck, it's a duck. Okay, just because they, we don't have hair on our bodies does not make us any less human. They are a type of people. They are not our type of people, but they are a people nonetheless. And they run their lives as such. Now their laws and their culture and their lives are very different from what ours are, but not any less important. You know, our words don't mean what their words do. So when they're speaking, sometimes there's a lot of miscommunication. What I do, I work with hundreds of people all around the world. And what I do is I kind of bridge that gap. I offer explanations, um, questions, you know, whatever. I learn a lot from these people as well. I am by no means above learning. I lo love nothing more than to learn from people. Okay, this is a picture right here of one whose name, and it should, this one is kind of blurry, the other ones show more form to it. Her name is Mawaka, and Mawaka hangs around, she loves to play in the front yard. At this point in time, she's roughly 12 foot tall. Her partner in life's name is Shandoa, and they have, at the time we moved in, he was much smaller. His name is Zerky, and Zerky, you can't see him in this photo. Um, I don't even know if I put his photo up because he's a child. Likes to hang out in all these bushes. He's basically torn so many of my trees down, it's ridiculous. And he plays in a very, very large um, tree in the front yard. 
He also comes up on the porch and steals all my feral cat food. We have a lot of feral cats, and I feed everything. Yeah, he likes to come up there. My door is, you have a solid door, and there's windows all the way around it. And more often than not, you will see him. He's all black, and he'll come up on the porch, and you'll see his head and these black arms reaching into the feral cat food bowl. So now the feral cats get fed twice a day, once during the day when they have a chance, once at night. But they run around the property at night or all day long. They're not nocturnal. If you leave with nothing else, please understand, these are not a nocturnal animal running around. They are very mobile at night because we are. But they are not less mobile. I've had more sightings in the day than I have at night. Okay, so anyway, this is, Pat was actually sitting in the house, and we did grand pictures. And she showed up right there, and then the following picture we took, she was gone. You can switch it. I do? Oh, wow. High tech. It's not moving. It's not moving. Isn't it just the arrow? I, I got your next picture. So you oh, okay. Okay. Remember, I told you about the shimmer, where it looks like the predator effect, and it looks—it literally looks gel. And the reason I put this up, well, it's not the best of the best photos. I wanted to show you that this gel thing right there, when they shimmer, that's in, you, sometimes it'll look like a wave, like almost like a wave of energy or shiny. They also do this gelled. And let's see if I can. Did you get it going? Uh, just give me a second. Okay. So this is a stick structure. One of the ways that you're going to tell, stick structures are a way of, of communication. They're not just there to look pretty. Some they are. Some are very decorative. And that's all, always a good thing. But they're there because they mean something, okay? But they can be decorative, don't get me wrong. There's so many multiple facets of the things that they do that you cannot limit it and say, oh, this is just because of this, okay? They do, everything is done for a reason. There's no coincidences, not a whole lot of random silliness. I mean, they do things for a reason. Unless, I mean, when they're playing, it's random. Now, this you can tell. And what I want you to notice about this, where <clears throat> if someone's walking through the woods, you're going to say, oh, look at that pile of sticks, okay? It's not a pile of sticks. They interlock. And very few times when you have the center tree right here, are you going to get one that's going to interlock where it goes between this piece and that piece? It doesn't fall like that. That's not natural. At first glance, it looks natural. But when you go up and look at it, you're going to see interweaving and the rest of the branches, you're going to see where it, what we call locks. And when it locks like that, it makes it very difficult to be a natural event. Okay? We go to the next one. You're good now. Oh, is it working? Now? Yeah, it's working. Now. Oh, you're the best. What would we do without Trent? Okay, so here's another one. And on this one, you can see where it looks like a pile of sticks. It surely does. But when you get to this point, you're going to see that it's woven in and out of these branches. It's wrapped around them. This was made at the back of my, all these, I want you to understand, all these photos were made at various places I've lived. I, I really, I try not to bring a lot of things that, I never use anybody else's photos, but these are things that happen at my house on a daily basis. Anybody that's been to my house can testify, you're walking into a freak zone. <laughs> you just are. This looks like a doorway. See how it goes here? But we don't have just one, we have two. And then back behind that area, was nothing but structure. So when you walk, it was like walking into Harriet's Museum. You walk through a doorway and then you see all these incredible things.
Now these are arches. These I actually took in South Carolina. And you're seeing all these. Now one thing that you can, they use them as directional tools. They also use them, the females will use them, and as disgusting as this sounds, where the base of that ends up, they will urinate on it to let the males know they are available, and the arch is going to tell them where they need to go to find them. Now the thing that you can really tell if it's a natural arch, because in Michigan it's really tricky, we have snow, we have lots of snow. So you get the arches that are made from the snow. So now we need to figure out how do we tell if it's made from the snow and how do we tell if it's actually from the Bigfoot. I'm going to tell you. When you get to the base of it, you're going to see that it's anchored. And by anchored I mean you'll have a log over the top of it. I've actually seen them take that and wind it around something. But something will be holding it there where it's not just the weight of something that's pushed it over. And that's how you're going to tell it's a true arch and it's definitely them. This is in my yard as well. And I cast this and then what I did before I pulled the cast out of the ground is I took pictures of it. This is a walkway. When you watch them walk, they literally, it's one foot in front of the other, okay? It's very streamlined. The only time I've seen anything different, and this has been in the snow, and I, I'm not gonna speak for every one of them, absolutely, but I do have one that when it's snow, he tends to waddle more, and there's more of a little bit of a difference between it. However, it is always very closely streamlined. One foot in front. Like they're walking on a tightrope. This particular individual, and I'm sorry I did not do it with the measuring tape there, had a five and a half foot stride. I don't know of a lot of humans whose stride is five and a half feet. Igor Borsep comes when he's in the States and spends probably three to four months at my house when he comes. And he was there that year that I did this. And he was doing these humongous steps. And he's a very tall man. He's got to be, I want to say 6'2", maybe. And he couldn't do it. He couldn't make them as hard as he tried. Okay, it froze again. Ah, oh, there we go. This is a baby dog, and this is Nico. Um, you can see the snout. You can barely see the eyes, but you can see his little ears. He was up about 30 feet in a pine tree. He is not a bear. I was laying in bed. Pat and I had just moved into a new home, and I was exhausted, but it was still, it was 8.30 at night, but in the south, that's still daylight. So I was in my jammies. I was relaxing, and he's mind speaking to me, telling me to come outside. And I said, I'm not coming out. I do what they call energy work. I do earth work. And they like to feel the energy that I can push towards them. And so he wanted me out there for under. That's what he wanted me for. And I told him I wasn't coming. He said, I'll let you get a picture. I said, no, you're lying to me. Because you guys none of you like to have a picture taken. They believe that the camera lens steals their soul. <coughs> and he said, no, 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 I promise. I said, all right, I'm coming out. But if I don't get my picture, you're not talking to me anymore because I don't talk to liars. And he gave me a picture. So he was not very old. He's still around. I don't have problems with the dogmen around me. There are some that are very, very bad. You have to understand that when it comes to these cryptids, especially the Bigfoot, I will never promote to you that they're all good, but I will also never promote to you that they're all bad. I would say it's a 70-30, 70, 70 being good. All right? But you, when you look at our people, we have murderers, we have psychopaths, we have pedophiles, we have rapists. They are a type of people. Those same illnesses, those same problems are in their people as well as ours. So to say that they're all bad is incorrect, but I cannot look at you in good conscience and say that they're all good because they're not any more than our people are. I will say this. I would rather be out in the woods with 100 Sasquatch or dog than be in the woods with 100 people that I don't know. I feel safer with them. And they're much kinder. Their love is a different love than we have. It's, in, it's incredibly deep. And they know how to project emotions. One of the abilities they have is they can do a projection, which they project emotions on you. 
when they project love on you, I defy anybody to have that done and not cry. Because it is that deep of a love. I call it the little love hug. This was found on my husband's pillow. The story of, <laughs> with this handprint, he was at work, I was at home all day long. I'm doing my thing, I'm cleaning house. I went in the bedroom, I had vacuumed, I made the bed, that pillow was clean. This pillow was actually a Star Wars pillow and on the front of it is Chewbacca. Chewbacca came about because George Lucas had an encounter when he was nine years old and that's how Chewbacca became. But the pillow was facing out. We have a lot of dogs, and I didn't want the dogs getting on the pillow. So I had the black part of it facing out. And I was making dinner. My husband came home. And prior to this, I had found a pile of like a white powder on the floor after I cleaned. We had wood floors in this section of the house. And I'm like, what is this? I have no idea what it is. And there were finger smears in it. And I said out loud, I said, I don't know which one of you did it, but start cleaning up after your mess. I went to go get the broom, I came back, and most of it was gone, but there was still re you know, residue from it. The, uh, this happens with a lot of people in a lot of their encounters. We don't know what this white powder is. I will say it does have the consistency of powdered sugar. I don't think, to my knowledge, nobody's ever tested it. I have tree drawings, which I'll show as well, and they were all done with the same residue. So I cleaned up the mess on the floor. I never went in and checked the bedroom. I had been home all day. Why am I worried about it? Pat came home from work, walked in the bedroom, went into our bathroom, took a shower, came out and said, so what's with the gigantic handprint? I'm like, what gigantic handprint? That one. And that print, it took months before that print would go away. Whatever it is that they use, it's long acting. Here's Dr. Igor Borstev. Looks like a wonderful picture of him out in my yard until you look back here. And right here, which I'm sorry guys, it's hard to see, I will have a close up of him, is an individual, his tribal name, I'm not gonna reveal, but we call him Brownie just because he's, at that time he was only nine and a half foot tall, he's almost 11 now. And he's all brown, very, very long hair. Um, the other thing I wanna point out with, on each one of these, please when you go into the woods or think that you're looking for Bigfoot, which don't chase them, make a bonfire, sit down, they'll find you. They hate to be chased. Um, everyone is different. Just like all of us here today, there's no two people in this audience that look alike. There's no two Bigfoots that look alike. They don't all have the cone-shaped head. I, Shadow's head is not any bigger than a normal man of our people. one that was behind Igor Borstaff. This is Brownie. There's his little blobby. He's got a really wide nose and he has more of a grayish brown um, face to him, but most of his face is covered in hair. 
This, I want people to see this because a lot of people don't understand that this actually happens. You know, in some areas the Bigfoot and Dogmen don't get along, but in just as many, if not more, they do. <coughs> Excuse me. They may not always be the best buddies, but again, they are all part human. So you have some that get along, you have some that don't. At my house, everybody gets along. It's kind of like a mandatory rule that I have. And unfortunately, sometimes we have oops babies, and this is one of them. This is Trudy. She is half Dogman and half Bigfoot. It does happen. Genetically, they can because of the ET human cross, and they do exist. And the head on them actually looks more like a teddy bear. They don't have a full canine snout, and they don't have full canine ears, but they do have a little snout, and they have little ears. This is her thigh, but right here, this particular one was born with a tail. Not all of them will come out with the tail. It just depends on, on how it ends up at the end of the day. Okay, this is what happens when you have a Christmas tree at my house. Most people have these lovely Christmas trees where you hang up your balls and your lights and everything's wonderful. Not me. I get two little dimensional creatures that show up. These are little hands, and you can see the little eyes and the noses. This particular group, um, it was mine and Pat's back first Christmas together, and my daughter and him and I were putting up a tree in our living room. We'd put a bulb out, they'd throw another bulb off on the ground. We'd put a strand of lights up, they'd knock the lights on the ground, and then you'd hear nothing but laughter. And this is laughter that all three of us could verbally hear with our ears, not just in our minds. We tried to decorate this tree. It took us almost four hours, and then we gave up. We got up the next morning. The tree had been taken into the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. A lot of these things, you guys, are pranksters. They're not all bad. Like, please don't go walk away from here thinking that all of these things are bad. That does, and we're going to touch base briefly on the things that could make them more aggressive and the, the missed signs that we get sometimes. This is a UFO. Um, this, you can see the bubble to the top of it. And these are the lights, and it actually lights would spin around it. This is the one that the MUFON came back and said it was a class one sighting. These pictures were taken from my front porch. Again, shows you how abnormal my normal is. My son-in-law is the one that took the, this particular photo. He did a tremendous job of it. Did it with his camera phone. It is a little blurry because it's been blown up so that you can see it a little bit better. So please excuse that. Also, they radiate energy. Everything on this planet and other planets is energy-based. Everything is done by energy and vibration. So when they move these crafts, a lot of energy is expelled from that. And so you get a lot of the, the, the around it, it's more pixelated. That's another problem. We're going to touch base on that, too, on the photos when you take um, of the Bigfoot. So we were, he went out on the porch and, bless his little soul, when he got to my house, him and my daughter are staying with us temporarily while they find their own home. He got a big shock. He always knew Mom wasn't crazy. First night he pulled in, a Bigfoot stepped out from the trees and is, like, looking at him like this. So that was his big introduction to the Bigfoot. ETs followed the next day. The dog men showed up. He went into what I call a paranormal meltdown. <laughs> Igor Borstep and I have a pair of binoculars that have night vision on them, and then you can take video and you can take pictures with it, if I'm ever bright enough to figure out how to do that. But you can see out of them quite well. And he spent every night, all night, for the first two weeks out there going, oh my gosh, there's one over there, there's one over there, there's one over there. Mom, there's an ET in the bushes right across from the driveway. So I started walking to him. He's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, if it wanted us dead, we wouldn't be here. You know, and I finally had to tell him, pace yourself, because more will come. So pace yourself. Okay, this is the craft. And then this is a scouter craft that was following behind it. They were out there for a good deal of time before it finally left. And at times that particular craft would have the multicolored lights. Other times it would go and it would spend white lights, but then it would also have the color. Okay, this is the photo I was telling you earlier that the pictures kind of got scrambled, and I apologize. 
This is a triangular shaped craft, and this is above my garage. This is that portal that the head was coming out of directly underneath of it. And again, these were taken probably 10 feet off my garage door.
This is a portal that is across the road from my driveway. The day Pat and I went and looked at the house, the way we determine what house we're living in is we go out and take photos and see what's in them. If nothing's in them, it's not the house for us because we don't know how to be normal. This is a giant head. We have yet to determine, there's the eyes, there's the mouth. We have yet to determine, we go back and forth and waver, is it a dogman head, is it a Bigfoot head? I'm going towards dogman, but then it depends on the day of the week. But it opens up, we've had gold bars, things look, come out of it, we've had dimensionals come out of it, we've seen foots come out of it. And it's been there the entire time we've been there. Thank you. Um, I want to touch base on a couple things. When it comes to taking photos, of them and there's always problems with that and we get in this industry we get a lot of complaints we get a lot of harassments a lot of it's fake if it's too clear people don't believe it if it's blurry they don't believe it bottom line they're not going to believe it okay when people are ready to accept what's out there they will you can't force it on them everybody has to come to it in their own terms there are a lot of hoaxers out there okay so it gives everybody a bad name. I know in my heart, and God knows in my heart, I'm not a hoaxer. I leave it at that. And if nobody else wants to believe it, there's nothing I can do about that. But when you take a picture of them, there's a few problems. If you were to center, like let's say I want to take a picture of Trent, and I'm going to have my camera. Normally, if you're taking photos of your family, you're going to center them right in the middle of it, right? Because you want a good picture. Don't do that if you want a Bigfoot, because they rate a certain level of energy and frequency. It distorts it. Also, one of the abilities that they have is to mess with your camera and electronics. Multiple people, when they are out with them, notice that their batteries are drained, they notice their cameras malfunction, and various other electronics get messed with. And you don't even want to know what they can do to a computer. But, so when you focus on them, you're giving them that ability to do that. Not that they can't off-center, but it is easier for them front and center. And because of the energy that they radiate in that higher level of vibration, for, let's pretend Trent's a Bigfoot. I'm going to take a picture of that. That speaker is what I'm going to take, and that's what's going to be my center. And I'm going to let him be on the outside loop of that photo. And I promise you, he's going to come out much clearer. Because when you center on them, it doesn't always work. Now, that being said, Again, remember I told you in the beginning, everything has multiple facets of how it works. We have Amish people. I grew up around Amish people. Every sector has different beliefs. Some will have cars, but they won't have other electronics. Others don't use anything electric. Others will use lights, but they don't use cars. So every different group has their own belief system and their own way of doing things. Bigfoots are a, a, a multi-dimensional being, which means they can be flesh and blood, then they can go into dimensions. They, can, they have different frequencies that allow them to do that. But there's some groups that don't want to do it. There's some groups that have walked away and turned their back on the paranormal abilities. They're all going to speak telepathically. You're not going to find one that can't because it's just a form of their communication system. But some of them will not do the cloaking, they will not use the other abilities. When that happens, you're going to see them stay flesh and blood all the time because they're not going to. The way that they learn about it is through their parents. If the parents don't teach them, then they don't know they have it. All right? My parents didn't teach me telepathy. I, I just started doing it. I wasn't aware that I could do it. But when I speak to my mom about it, she's like, I don't know how to do it. My mom never taught me to do it. If you don't use it, you lose it. And you can get it back once you start doing it, but if you don't know you have it, how are you going to know that you even, it even exists? And that's what's happened with us. This is why it's so hard for us to be able to understand these abilities and the things that they do. Are they flesh and blood? 100%. Are they going to stay flesh and blood all the time? No, not really. But they can be that flesh and blood, and I think that's what helps to divide our camps between are they a flesh and blood person? Or are they multidimensional? They're both. And they choose in the clan that they live in on what rules they want to follow and what beliefs that they're going to share with their children. Now you can take a child from one that doesn't believe, the family units don't believe in using the paranormal abilities, and that child as it grows up 
might take a mate or a partner in another clan and go there that uses all those paranormal abilities. And it will be converted over and it will use it. So they can use it. It's just some of them don't realize that they have it to use. So when you're taking photos, as we just said with Trent, you're going to offset them. You don't want them in the middle. And the other thing is, is when they cloak, they are so focused on keeping that energy up and that vibration up that they're not as focused on messing with the camera because they know you can't see them. So why mess with it? Why use that extra energy to mess with your camera if you can't see them? So what happens is, and Pat and I do this a lot, we stand in a circle and we go click, 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 click. We aren't, we aren't on anything. We aren't focused on anything. We take more random pictures than any normal person ever should. And then you take those random photos and you put it on a screen and you blow it up and you're like, oh my gosh, there's a face, there's a face. Oh, look it, there's a whole body. Because they aren't worried about you getting their photo. And when you take a photo of any being, I don't care if it's a dogman, a Bigfoot, a lizard person, a cat person, any being, and I've seen all these things, and the ETs, and you take their photo while they're cloaked, surprise, they show up. So there are ways to get photos. But instead of trying so hard to find that particular individual to snap a photo of, if you get lucky enough to see it, off-center it. If I'm going to take a picture of this lovely woman right here, I'm going to focus on that guy over there so that she's in that frame. But she's not the center of it. And I'm going to get a great picture of her. And when you go out there and take your random photos and they're cloaked, you'll get them. If you can't get a photo of a cloaked Bigfoot or any of these other beings, then they're not there to begin with because they will show up. Does it, at this point, does anybody have any questions that they feel like they want to talk about while I'm up here? <laughs> Certainly. Well, you've got a mic, so I got one. Oh, good. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned that your life had been threatened. Yes. Could you talk about that? Um, basically what it boiled down to is as I got deeper in this, and again, I want to point out, I didn't try to get into any of this. I never went looking for Bigfoot. Bigfoot found me. Um, I don't go out and chase them through the woods. And as I was working with the Bigfoot and more would come around me, I became very much aware of helicopters following me every place. It, I mean, I was kind of dim-witted about it. I was like, you know, what's the big deal? What are they looking for? Until I would get five of them hovering around my property all day long. And the more I learned, and then the Bigfoot were taking me aside and teaching me energy work and teaching me healing work and, and all these other things. And the more I learned, the more the government noticed me. And the more other people noticed me that were non-government. And the first time I got threatened was I was... On Facebook, I'd only been on Facebook a year, and I had met a researcher that was a former police officer, and he called me at home, he messaged me on Facebook, he said, can I call you? And I was like, sure, I gave him my number. He said, listen, you know, I'm former police. I said, yeah. He said, there's been a death threat on you. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, there's yourself and six other female researchers, and the plan is there's a group of people that are planning to bash your head in with a lead pipe, they are thinking that what will happen if they do this with all these female researchers is as your brains are oozing out on the ground, your Bigfoots are going to come in and save you. And he said, you're going to notice that there's a cop car at the end of your driveway. And I go to the window, and there is. He says, you're on surveillance. I want you to not worry about it. I don't want you to send your children to school until you get a clearance for me. You guys are on lockdown. I'm like, okay. So I stayed home, and I played out in the woods with my foot. So the next time was I did, I got back from Siberia. And I figured, you know, that was fun, but I figured what happened in Siberia would stay in Siberia. It doesn't work that way. I got home and got met at the airport. First they pulled me around in customs, and I thought I did something wrong. And they're like, no, you're the girl that was on TV. We want to talk to you. So I talked to them. I left the airport to be hit with every major news network, MSNBC, NBC, ABC, CBS, CNN. Everybody was like light bulbs in the face, not only in Russia, but here. So I didn't want to do any more conferences. I didn't need that. I had kids. And I had big kids to deal with. And so a friend of mine had a very small conference in Mayo, Michigan. Okay, I'll do it for you. I went up there, had a very good time. There was a gentleman there that had this super secret. Everybody's got a super secret site that they research him. Wanted me to go up there because he wanted to see if I could really talk to him telepathically. 
Apparently I proved my case because the next thing I knew a plan was hatched that I would be kidnapped, I would be put in a cage out in the middle of the woods, and then when the Bigfoot came in to rescue me, they were going to bag a foot. This particular area had nothing but cameras. He had hooked up with a major network to do a documentary. He had footage of them. He had over 100 cameras, very expensive cameras, all around the property. Um, the, most of them, not all, I don't want anybody to think I'm speaking for every Bigfoot that's out there, um, have the belief that the camera lens steals, steals their soul. They don't want to cross that camera lens. So they had some very elderly ones in there that refused to leave the land because they, didn't, they couldn't figure out a way to get out where the cameras were at. So they were stuck there. And when, as soon as I said to the guy, you know what, you've got them here that can't leave. Like, where's, what's going on with all these cameras? So anyway, now the plan's hatched that they're going to catch me. So basically what I did was I sent dogmen up there to destroy every camera, which they did. Hundreds of thousands of dollars of cameras were destroyed. I don't feel bad about it. And the Bigfoot went up there and destroyed the cage. They no longer have a cage. And he was so distraught over it that the plan to catch me was kind of derailed. There's no more cage anymore. The cameras aren't there. Anything needed. So I got out of that one. Then I met Melba. We did the DNA study. Now, if the DNA study isn't correct, why does the government want to shut it down? If it's fake, I mean, who cares? If it's not going to give out the correct information, who is going to care? Because, like I said before, Bigfoot industry, people are not believed all the time. The only time you get threatened is if you're right on target. And that's exactly what happened with the Ketchum study. At that point, she got death threats. I got death threats. Other people on the team got death threats. Because we got it right. Okay? They don't want this information out. They're never going to want this information out. But the cat's out of the bag, guys. It's already out there. They're out there. But once every three years, they want to come forward so that people can see them. So yeah, that was that was how. And I'm getting harassed now, but we've got, we've got another question up front here. Absolutely. Is there any right, right, right. right, yes. okay. uh, Is there any possibility that maybe they're not flesh and blood, that they appear that way to us? Because we are flesh and blood, and we relate to that. Because that would explain why we never find their dead, we never find their bones. Uh, you know, they're so elusive and everything. Mm -hmm. It's just an idea. I think it's an excellent question, and I think there's two questions in that statement. Number one, the reason why we believe that they aren't flesh and blood at certain times is we did have flesh that we tested in the study. Um, there was a very bad man that killed two of them by baiting them with food and then he killed the male and he killed a child one of which was twins and you know karma's going to come for him at some point if the foots don't get him first but regardless so we did have that flesh to test that was the only reason why i can say to you that yes there are at some point in time flesh and blood otherwise i, I would look at you and i would say i can't prove that to you you know I'm, i have no problem saying i don't know an answer to a question but in, in that case that's why the other thing that you had brought up, and I wanted to touch base on it, and then it just popped right out of my head. You had said about the flesh and blood, and then you said something else. Why don't we find their dead? Very good reason for that. Excellent question. They buried their dead. How many of us out here would give up one of their family relatives' bodies? I see no hands, because we don't, and neither do they. They do a funeral ceremony. They have a certain way that they bury their dead, which goes to certain traditions that different clans have gotten from the Native Americans and they do bury them and the way they bury them makes it very difficult to find. They are not left out in the woods where they decompose or the animals get them. I mean I'm sure that occasionally you know we have had people that have gone missing or died tragically you know alone out in the woods and that's happened to them. No more in their people. Hey, Robin, I got your question right here. Hi, uh, this is our first Bigfoot conference. Welcome. Glad to have you. Thank you. Um, so we ranch out in the Sand Hills in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. uh, I was told we also ranch next to Pine Ridge, and we have a medicine man that comes on and helps oh, us out. And he said, Bigfoot's on your land. And I would like to engage a relationship or okay. at least research, and I just want to know 
what is the best way to go about it? I have a crystal I could give them. I know we were talking. Somebody be careful talking giving about crystals, and I'm going to okay. tell you why. Um, crystals they love, okay, and they use them. They absolutely use them. Crystals have different abilities in them. Depending on what crystal, know what crystal you're getting, giving to them before you give it to them. There's nothing wrong with giving them a gift of crystals because they love it. Do your research on the crystals to make sure it's not something that they can use to harm anybody. They will also take selenite and they use it like a looking glass. Once they charge it from the sun, they'll put it in various places and they can literally watch you from it. I had a very good friend that that happened to. And I had been called into an area where the Bigfoots were trying to harm people. And they put a very large crystal out for us so they could keep an eye on us. Once you do that and they're watching you, the only way to stop that is to put it in very deep water. Needless to say, we took a lovely drive over the bridge that went over Lake Erie and pitched that sucker right into the water. As far as the answer to your question on how you can make contact, I, every researcher is different. Um, I'm not going to say any researcher is wrong because I don't do that. I don't believe in that. What I will say is this. My belief in what my husband and I do and the people that we take out in the woods, we don't run around chasing them. We may walk through the woods and look for stick structures because I'm fascinated with them. I'm constantly learning about them. But, you know, I'm not going through the woods 90 miles an hour and I'm not trampsing all over. Now, sometimes you have, that, have no other option but to do that. In your case, it's a little bit different. What I recommend to you, have a bonfire. Sit out there. Cook some food on it. Laugh. When you're laughing, it raises your energy, it raises your vibration, and it becomes a big beacon where you may not see it going up in the air, they can feel it up in the air. And if they are out there, they will find you. Don't make your bonfire in the middle of their stick structures. And for heaven's sakes, don't mess with their structures. They work hard on those. They're there for meaning. They're there for communication. They belong. But, like, if you found stick structures, let's say you were where you're sitting at as a stick structure. I would go 100 or 200 foot away from that area because I don't want to make them mad. I want a positive experience. I don't want a negative one. Negative ones, you're not going to get any more contact. The positive ones will last your lifetime. Because when they like you, they like you for life. Okay? So, and another thing is almost, I don't know if you are here yesterday, but a lot of our vendors are researchers, mm -hmm. like Robin. Absolutely. They would love to tell you some starter things, that you and they're all going to be different. Yeah, everybody does things differently. There's not what I would, you know, I would never say a researcher is doing it wrong. It's just another reason to it's check out our vendors' them. booths. You know, but they'd love to know, talk your off. So what I will say above all of it, respect. They deserve our respect. They've done nothing not to earn that respect. We have another question, right? Sure. Just a couple things. Um, one is you said something about you do earth work. Yes, I do. In energy. Giving energy, I don't know anything about that. Okay, energy so. is, we all, everybody's energy based, everything in the planet's energy based. The earth is a conductor, the earth is the biggest energizer battery you will ever see in your lifetime. So basically what I do is I use the energy from my body to do various things for them, whether it be an open a portal, open a rift, do healing on them, whatever they need me to do. Um, I also build energy walls for protection, energy bubbles, and if I don't have enough energy in my broken down body, I pull it from the earth. If you feel like you're run down, take your shoes off, stand out on the ground, imagine in your mind, telekinesis is real, of pulling energy up through the bottom from the earth, up through the bottom of your feet and into your body. It works. I see. Um, thank you. And then healing, you, you're being taught healing. If you're able to tell us anything about what kinds of healing, is it to help people, us? I, I primarily do the cryptids, I do the ETs, I choose what I heal and what I don't. If I don't feel it's good, I don't do it. I have done some healing on people, but I try not to, I'm not a medical professional. But I can, yes. And there's another follow-up. I got one follow-up. If I misunderstood you, I, did you say through the portal you got a gold bar? We did. It, was, it looked like a gold, floating gold bar. It was not a solid mass, but it was looks like a gold bar, like a hologram of one. I have a photo of it. Um, I'm welcome. I'm more than happy to show you later. But it just floated out. There's a question over here. Okay. Just to fall down that rabbit hole, you mentioned that these Sasquatch, these dogmen are all in some way or another related to the ETs. They are, but we also have to take notice and say that the government has taken over a lot of things and they have also made and created their own cryptids. And I'm here to tell you the ones they have created are very deadly. So, is there one particular race of ET that 
To my Ashley knowledge, Hayden no. Groups, we have several um, contacts that, as well as myself, that have spoke to the ETs about it, and it doesn't seem to be any certain race that's doing it. It's basically, you know, it's part of the cattle mutilations, part of the DNA taken from us. Looks like we got another question up front. Um, we had a couple different people say how old they think they are. Yeah. How old do you feel that these um, are? We've drive? talked to some that have claimed that they've gotten four to 500 years in age. I think an average to be safe would be 200. But these are ones, and there was one that actually said that they were 667. So. But you have to understand, those are the ones that go more in between dimensions. I, my own personal belief, I have nothing to back this up on. My own belief is that as they're going through these portals and dimensions, there is no time there. And we've created time. And because of what's in them and the energy that radiates from them, it, it changes the body chemistry. So I, in my personal opinion, that has a lot to do with it. The more they stay in physical form on our planet, I think the shorter their lifetimes are. But I mean, still they're well over 100 years old, 200 years old, if they stay in physical form. Any other questions? Oh, hold on, we've got another one up front. Great questions, you guys. I, I was just wondering, you said they live so many years. Do they acknowledge a creator, and what do they believe in the afterlife They're, after they die? Excellent question. I appreciate that. I wanted to touch base on that. They are very spiritual. They are. They answer to creator. Um, each clan, each tribe will refer to it as a different term, as when Christy spoke the other day. But um, my particular group, it's creator. But they are very spiritual. They answer to the same God that they claim is ours. They may call it a sun God, a moon God, what Christie's plan calls hers. There's very many different types of names that they are used, but it is actually all the same. And it's our creator. Looks like we get another question here. From what I'm told, what they've shared with me. Um, you're talking about the portals and whatnot, mm -hmm. and I have a question, I guess, kind of contra just thinking your opinion of it. If that's the case, why are they seeing chasing animals, um, chasing deer down, carrying deer, if they can go in between dimensions? What's the point of killing animals for food if they can go? Because they live on our planet. They try to develop some ways from us. They're going to eat just like we do. We have cattle ranches and we kill our cows and we eat our cows. So they're going to do the same thing. They still have to eat. They still have to take nourishment. They eat a great deal of food. They, need, they don't just stick to meat. They eat plants. They eat vegetables, meat, fish. So they're going to hunt. So, so there's no Sasquatch high V. No, I wish. No, no, no. So no high V. And if you, when you put food out, if you think you're ever going to give them enough food to sustain them, you are so wrong. There's no way to do it. Um, when you're doing gifting, watch how much you're gifting. It's, it's perfectly fine to gift. A lot of researchers will take out gifts for them that they've asked for, including my friend Duke Sullivan, who they absolutely adore and love, and he always brings them exactly what they ask for. That's a wonderful thing. Um, try to refrain from putting them out consistently every day at the same time. I did that because I didn't know better. I didn't have problems, but I do know people that do afterwards. I know we're getting close to time. Yeah. Uh, maybe one or two more questions here. Can they see an infrared? Pardon? Can they see an infrared? Yes. So these guys run around in the fields with the cameras in their face and everything and all this. They know they're stuff. there. Okay. Number one, they know what's in your heart. They know your thoughts before you say them. They know what person you are. They know if you have darkness in your heart. They know if you have love in your heart. And they're going to know you're there. So as we wrap up, uh, just a question. You, I know in your bio, you, you don't just deal with Sasquatch and, and dogma and cryptids. Can you... Just, and I, know it's a I deal with everything. Can you just <laughs> list some of the other cryptids you've Okay, um, and I can show photos back in the back. Um, I had lizard man in my backyard. I deal with cat people. I've talked to goat men. I've talked to many, many races of ETs, you know, greys, Nordics, whatever. If there's a cryptid out there, I can generally talk to it or it's contacted me at one point in time. Um, as I said, the government's making a lot of crazy things and dropping them off. The ETs are also on a rampage making even more um, cryptids and dropping them off. I have an unnamed cryptid at my place right now. The, the Bigfoot's called the cryptids that don't have a name, a Makaya. It's the name of a blanket for it. So yeah, if there's a cryptid out there, I generally talk to it. And I, I have photos in the back and show you. We have one more question, then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Can the ETs protect us from nuclear war? They already have. They've stopped nuclear warheads already. 
they, um, there are more good ETs than bad. I'm not convinced that the government has not created the bad ones. Um, I've gone up against the bad ones before. I've also ended up in intensive care from the bad ones. And the Bigfoots are the ones that healed me. They saved me five times. I seem to be a work in progress for them. But yeah, they do. Okay, uh, I think that's about it. Trent, yeah. how, about a, how about a big round of applause? Yeah. <laughs> well and is active and he works with me on all of this and we will both be at the back table so if anybody has any questions you're more than welcome to ask and we will be here all day thank you so much all right. you guys have a great day thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.